Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and speaking in Leiden again. And uh, I'd like to share with you today the work that we're doing in Maastricht over the last uh, four years. And uh, I will start by uh, talking about um, first disclosing that I'm also a shareholder in a startup company because the inventions that we made were licensed out to a company and the company asked me to be part of their uh, board. So the talk today is about the beauty and benefits of cryo-EM and my work has been already for a long time on revealing the macromolecular complex in TB that is responsible for uh, providing access in the cytosol from the phagosome, which I will discuss later. But, but before I do so, I would like to make, uh, because I'm in, at Nissan, which I have my heart very close to, a little historical perspective. And this historical perspective starts uh, from a meeting that was organized by Werner Hacks at FEI, together with people from the NIH and the National Science Foundation in Fort Lauderdale. And this meeting was, I think, a tipping point in structural biology, even though people didn't realize it, perhaps, at that time. But the paradigm shift was, at that moment, to go from 2D to 3D EM. It is hard to believe now that people were wondering about this, but at that time it was really an issue. And you can see that the key people that are still in the field uh, were present at that meeting. And that many of those people really participated in making this paradigm shift possible. And it was thanks to these leading people in the world that Werner Hucks got enough ammunition to also uh, make things move uh, at uh, the company in Eindhoven. And it was first Marim van Heel who got the first Polara as a real cryo-EM uh, before the old-fashioned cryo-EM was introduced uh, by um, Jacques Dubouchet, which I later will discuss, and Bob Glazer. And in Maastricht, Maastricht was the third cryo-EM lab in the world. You can't believe it, perhaps, but Werner Hucks made at uh, Philips a site entry holder, cryo-EM uh, holder, and he tested it with Peter Friedrich in the street. So that was the history then, and that changed, I think, a lot in the field, and as you can see, later it became the cryos that uh, got uh, initially a lot of skepticism. Uh, there was no good results. Uh, there was one in the Centrum and one in Baumeister's lab. And uh, I learned that the leadership at uh, FEI was about to stop the production of the cryos. While uh, the first movers in the field really saw the potential and pushed this. And luckily I was also able to push it myself because uh, I got an email from my best friend Hans Klievers, who uh, was at that time already the director of the Hubrecht Institute and later the president of the Dutch Academy of Science. And Hans mentioned to me that there was a roadmap on large infrastructure and that we would be able to propose an idea for about uh, 40 million euro. So that is uh, quite a lot of money. And uh, he woke me up and uh, I thought this is really something to do. So I locked the door in the kitchen of my house for about uh, two months and connected to lots of people, deans and provosts at universities and many chairs in the department of EM and also cell biology and um, structural biology, the X-ray and NMR people, until we got a group together of senior cryo-EM people together with leadership at uh, FEI to initiate uh, what now is uh, Nissan. And I think that uh, this is uh, the, the first meeting that we ever had to bring us all together. And from almost all of them, there are only two now still left in the cryo-EM community. That's Brom and myself. So things can go very fast in 10 years. But um, many more things went very fast. And that is the revol resolution revolution and the Nobel Prize winners that uh, resulted from that. And here are those that uh, you all know. But I put this slide together to also acknowledge the people, in fact, in Eindhoven that normally don't get uh, this recognition. But these are really key people that, if they would have not have been, been to pushing it, we would not have gotten perhaps the Nobel Prize winners, because it was the interplay between the production of the machinery and the bright science together. 
And so, thanks to this work, they got last year uh, the, the Gold Edison Award in New York. And uh, I think that Werner Hux there again is one of the leaders, as you can see on the left. And then Dominique, who did uh, his PhD in Maastricht and uh, unfortunately too early died. And then Remo Wagner and uh, Ben Bormans in the factory, who in fact were responsible for initiating and building these machines and getting to the specs that was needed. And then you know many of those perhaps yourself that played a role. So with that, I'd like now to go to my own work and start by showing the principle of cryo-EM that we all know, but uh, for the sake of this uh, movie, I'd like to explain it also in detail to those who will watch later. We need to get a purified sample in order to get structure of a protein. We put a purified protein on the grid, <coughs> then look in the EM, get images, get duty protections, do alignment of particles, get a 3D map and a 3D model. And um, I will today discuss primarily the first uh, part of it, the specimen preparation. Uh, since the specimen preparation is one of the elements that is still of a big problem. And to summarize what is needed, you have a purified protein in a tube and you want to bring a very thin layer uh, in ice that can go into the microscope. And so you have the three millimeter grid with the squares. You have in the squares the holes. And in the holes you need to have the ice spanning in the hole in a very thin uh, situation so that you can make images through the protein. And you can see over there the, the, the holes are about one micrometer. So achieving this goal is not a trivial thing. And so we have been able to do it in the last uh, 10, 15 years thanks to the work that was done by Jacques, Jacques de Boucher, who uh, in fact uh, got the idea when he was a group leader at the EMBL to plunge freeze viruses and proteins in liquid ethane rather than liquid nitrogen in order to get amorphous ice. And by doing so, he got very good structure. And it was uh, Peter Friedrich at that time in Maastricht who got this idea from Jacques. And he, with the next door workshop, worked on getting a vitrobot. Many prototypes followed first, but at the end there was a product generated and this product in fact has now been sold over about 500 labs all over the world. And in all the papers that you currently see, mostly this instrument is used to get uh, proper samples being prepared. And uh, Frank Naples was in his team the technical expert and the man with the creative ideas. And once I moved to Maastricht, I happened to uh, get an opportunity to recruit uh, Frank in my team. And that was a very good choice. And Frank and uh, some other people in the lab together established the next generation vitrification devices. Because we have still problems. As you can see here, it looks like a perfect EM sample many pure proteins, but if you look very carefully, they all have a preferred orientation. They all stick in the water-air interface. And it's very difficult to get 3D structure of this particular protein called ESPB that we are working on. So we need to make better specimen preparations because this is not an only example. There are the most scientists have this problem. And in fact, uh, Bob Glazer, who is also among the top five to ten in the cryo-EM community gave got a very great uh, honor a few weeks ago by getting a prize. And even Bob, in his title of his talk, brings the improvement of specimen preparation as an important issue and there's a quest for it. So that is uh, therefore important to focus on. And Frank, in fact, uh, as being a specialist, uh, built together with uh, a team of about five, six people over the last four years, an instrument that we call VitroJet. And over there you can see the machine as it currently is built in Maastricht. We have one machine working now for about uh, half a year routinely, and we are building five new instruments for better test the laboratories all over the world. And I'd like to share with you how this machine works by showing a quick movie. And this movie starts with the cassette in which we have already pre-clipped EM grids, so there's no need to later do the clipping. 
and uh, we are here bringing this uh, cassette into the instrument and then a grapper rather than a forceps takes them. You can do glow discharging in this uh, small chamber and then by having it made hydrophilic with a contact angle of 20 degree, you can focus the grid on a dew point element and a pin that uh, can be focused relative to it. Then you take a picoliter of sample and then you write a very thin layer of 15 nanometer or a little bit thinner or thicker on an EM grid and then you apply jet freezing and by applying jet freezing you cool the sample so fast that the clip cannot anymore transmit its heat to the sample and therefore it remains amorphous and you can then store it in a cassette or in a standard uh, other cassette for storage in liquid nitrogen. This one actually fits into a Arctica or into a Cryos, but we are also building this for the JOL instruments that are currently being developed, like the one that is now installed in Brussels. And so here you can see uh, how Frank and Carmen and uh, Julia are preparing samples. Currently we still do it in a 10% humidity room, but the idea is that soon it will be possible to do it also uh, at normal atmosphere. We like to have uh, low humidity to avoid contamination. There you can see the machine uh, moving. And on the upper right you can see the, the writing. So while we are preparing and the sample and freezing it, you can record what you have done and then later look back, back and see what has happened and what is the best sample to take and where to collect your images. And this is what you then see uh, in your record. And that is comparable to what you can see in the microscope. And in fact, we can very well see where to, to collect data using this uh, camera. And here you can see the result of the writing. Rather than a line, we have now learned that making a little ellipse around is uh, better. And then you can get very nicely see where to later collect uh, the data. And you need to only Occupy four or five of these squares to have enough uh, sample for um, recording. And then, just after finishing the writing, within 40 milliseconds, the sample is uh, jet frozen. And so this writing and this jet freezing is uh, being filed as a new IP from the Maastricht University. And uh, we are very eager to push this further and to also get not only one sample, but perhaps uh, 10 samples at the same time on one EM grid, so that you can do fast screening. And also building novel grids that do not have any more, uh, the, the, let's say, the, the clip that you need to apply on it, but have an all-in-one grid in which you have a prepared sample ready to go, so that you don't need to do clipping anymore. Or start using complete different technologies in which we apply MEMS devices. So these are kind of silicon nitrate nanochambers in which we can let a sample go in and then vitrify it. That thanks to the fact that we can do jetting and therefore we can allow more mass in the sample. So after having said this, I'd like to show you the result, uh, how it looks like in the EM. So from the cryo EM, you can go to the holes and then look inside two samples, as you can see on the right. And then here we have uh, the result of about uh, four uh, test samples, and these are being generated on an Arctica 200 kilovolt with a Falcon 3 camera. And also this instrument now can generate uh, very easily uh, these kind of uh, data. So one night collecting of uh, one of the proteins uh, after having it vitrified, and then two days of reliance is sufficient to get uh, to uh, three angstrom resolution. And currently we're getting already 2.5 angstrom on over 200 kilovolt. Arctica is the Falcon 3 camera. So it is really unbelievable what you can achieve with uh, the current setup that uh, is available. So this is uh, work done in Maastricht over the last year. And so we think that uh, by pin printing and by jet freezing in this machine that I just showed you, and uh, we are now eager to look to new samples, uh, more difficult samples, also transmembrane protein complexes. And also we are eager to mix many proteins. You can imagine that you can do writing of one protein like this, another protein like that, and they will mingle together in the center and from there they will perhaps diffuse or have one protein and some compound. 
that triggers in biochemical reaction or with, with uh, light or with a uh, cage compound system in order to provoke uh, very fast for the cryo EM. And so these are the things that we are working on. And then we got also a collaboration with our colleagues in Munich, that is uh, not far from Maastricht, only half an hour away, where they have a protein, the amyloid uh, beta 1 to 42, and they collected data on our instrument. Uh, uh, once the Falcon 3 was up and running with the, all the, let's say, uh, ad uh, advances that this Falcon 3 has, and by uh, doing so, we achieved uh, of this federal structure atomic resolution and in this atomic resolution you can see how this uh, fibril is built up. A fibril that is key for Alzheimer's disease but for the purpose of this talk I will not go into the details of this and this was work done by uh, people at Judith together with uh, Carmen Lopez Iglesias and uh, Raymond Ravalli in our lab and here you can see the beautiful atomic results that were achieved and published um, in 2017. So now I go back to my own, um, my own passion and my own drive, why I do de develop all this cryo-EM, and that is because I've been working already for almost my entire career on antigen-presenting cells, macrophages in the immune system, and see how they interact with the host pathogen, and how pathogens uh, then survive in the host. And I have chosen TB as the most important pathogen that kills the most people still on the planet. And this is, by the way, uh, from yesterday's uh, newspaper published in The Guardian, saying that London became again the capital of TB in Europe, and there are more than 5,000 TB patients being diagnosed in the UK, and nearly 40% are Londoners. So TB is still one of the leading causes of death in the world, and it is therefore very important to address this disease. And also because more and more people develop multi-drug resistant strains and uh, we have now more than 300,000 multi-drug resistant cases all over the world that are very difficult to treat. And so I realized this already a long time ago and I've been working on TB for a very long time and I quickly summarized the, the main results that we achieved and that is that we discovered that uh, TB once it is taken up in the lung and taken up in the macrophage in the lung, has the capacity to be able to go over the membrane of the phagal lysosome. And so by uh, punching holes, you could say, or any other way, uh, interfering in the integrity of the bilayer, being able to escape from this harsh lysosomal environment and getting to the cytosol. And what we discovered over the years is that for this there is a secretion system responsible and this secretion system acts like a needle. And uh, we have found that if you are able to bring the 10 genes of the secretion system into a non-pathogenic uh, vaccine strain, that this vaccine strain also acts like the real virulent TB strain and that uh, this PCG goes to the cytosol and can create a, a disease in a... Uh, guinea pig. So apparently a very important virulence factor and if you were able to block this system, you would block this process, then the bacteria would be killed like the BCG in the lysosome. So our task is to get after the structure of this type 7 secretion system, there are several and we are focusing on ESX1 since this is the one responsible for the translocation and um, if we have resolved the structure, one can then think of designing drugs to interfere in its functioning, but you can also think of designing vaccines that are based on what is actually on the outside of this. Uh, and this is then one of the very few transmembrane protein complexes that we know of that exist in TB that in fact uh, are exposed to the outside world. It, you, it is hard to believe, but we don't know of uh, many more than a few that in fact stick out of the membrane in TB currently that can be seen by the immune system. And so when you vaccinate this BCG, you make peptides against many proteins inside the bacteria, you generate antibodies, but they, those antibodies can never interfere in the TB itself because they are 
against proteins in a cytosol. And what you want to have, have is antibodies that interfere against protein complexes that exist on the outside. So we think that this is a good candidate for also vaccine development. So we wanted to express individual subunits of this type 7 secretion system, but they did not work. They all were falling apart. And we discovered, based on work from Gabriel Waxman, that you need a core complex. And the core complex is about five of those proteins co-expressed on the very, let's say, moderate levels in E. coli using a PQ link factor. And by doing so, we were able to get a 1.5 megadalton uh, complex. And so we were able to demonstrate by Western blotting that all the proteins are present and that by native gel uh, and Comasi blue, we were able to see that this entire complex is more or less properly folded because we see a very large 1.4 megadalton complex. So this then was necessary to generate in order to do single particle cryo EM. And here you can see some of the team members that have been working in the last two, three years to get after the structure. And we have reached this kind of level, but unfortunately we have not received uh, any atomic structure because the protein samples are still not good enough despite uh, all the effort of these people over the last few years. And it's not only us, there are at least uh, four groups in the world working on it, not on ESX1 necessarily, but on ESX3 or 5. And they also have difficulties getting. There is a group in Amsterdam working with a group in Hamburg, and they published uh, in the uh, eight angstrom detail of the ESX5 that you can see in the right. But they are also working on getting more detail. So single particle, cryo-EM, is high on the list, but no results to show. And what we want to do also is to look to this complex in situ. And for that, we express this, uh, this complex with a GFP on one of the subunits and then we found uh, uh, in bacteria, uh, as we had expected, uh, these elements in the periphery of the E. coli. Like you can also find them in mycobacteria. So this is then, uh, let's say, good news to vitrify samples and start doing cryo-EM electron tomography. And for that, we again use the VitroJet in a slightly modified version. We, after fixing, look by cryo LM and see where we can find uh, the protein expressed in the bacteria in phagosomes, make lamellae, as you can see on the slide, and then go to either our own microscope or the one here downstairs at Nissan and collect data. So on the upper part, you can see the fluorescence, the cryo-LM, and then in the middle, you can see how a lamella looks like. And from the bottom right, you can see the top view. This one goes into the TEM, and then you make a tilt series, and then get 3D reconstruction of the thin lamella, as you can see on the right, in order to get proper atomic detail when possible. <coughs> so for that, you need to vitrify again the sample. <coughs> it used to be done by... Um, the traditional way, using the Vitrobot, you cannot use copper grids because they are toxic, so you use gold grids, the cells grow on it, you infect them, and then you, um, vit you vitrify them. And by, by doing it and by blotting, you, as you can see on the right, you damage uh, a large part of the grids. And if it is not damaged, it will be damaged by the clipping, because these gold uh, grids are very fragile. So we worked on this for two or three years and had lots of, let's say, frustration in getting good samples in the microscope. Uh, and then once they were in the microscope, we learned, like colleagues in the world, that uh, even though you had some samples in the microscope, these cells 10 micrometer high were of low quality. They did not freeze very well. And as this work from Julia Mahamid also shows in the supplement, uh, the center of the cell clearly undergoes uh, incomplete vitrification. And so this was for us a trigger to consider the jet freezing, because the jet freezing we discovered has a much higher freezing rate, maybe five to ten times higher. Um, and here you can see how we now use gold grids and then vitrify from both sides. 
Um, and this is still with the forceps. You can also do that with a modern uh, grid or jet. You can see now the results of a grid that is vitrified. Here you can see that we still use uh, a modified uh, feed robot. So we have uh, modified the blotting devices so that we can very carefully monitor the pressure and the location, uh, much more precise than before, to reduce the damage. And then we do the jetting, as you can see. Here is the blotting, and then here you can see the jetting. The, on both sides, the ethane will start jetting until the sample is uh, well frozen. So after that, uh, we place uh, these machines into the cryofipsem, and Alexander Rigor uh, from uh, Thermo Fisher made a very nice movie that I like to share with you. I got it from him to show it, uh, and this explains how currently uh, we are making these very thin lamellae of vitrified cells. So this is the cyrus as we have it in uh, Maastricht actually a much too large chamber that uh, in brings in too much contamination that we would like to get rid of. Uh, but uh, we get the results, so I'm happy with that and like to share it with you. We deposit a platinum uh, on, the, on the frozen cells in order to reduce charge. We image using this electron beam and then we start to mill with an ion beam. So, for the doing that, you need to uh, determine where exactly you need to do the milling. So, we use the CryoLM data, import those using the MAPS software into the CIOS in order to determine at X, Y, and Z where to make the lamellae. And that is still not trivial, especially in Z. In Z it is difficult to uh, determine the good resolution, and therefore we don't get always the right site. But here you can see that. Uh, you can make lamellae relatively easy. We make them thinner than people do that use a 300 kilovolt, since we have only a 200 kilovolt. So about uh, one in four of these lamellae is so thin that it becomes too fragile and may break on its way to the other microscope. 120 nanometers is what we like to use. Then we do again an inorganic platinum sputter coating on the lamellae to uh, reduce charging if you do tomography using the faceplate that was discovered by the Bormeister lab in Jürgen Pritzker to get improved results. So that is now the current routine in our lab. We make about uh, six of those lamellae in one morning and then just before we transfer it to the electron microscope we clean them using the very same procedure to get rid of all the ice that was built up during the process. And then we go to the TEM and make the recordings of one site where we, in contrast to the 300 kilovolt, only make 30 images to have still enough of uh, information in each image to get proper alignment. <coughs> Since it is a uh, 200 kilovolt without an energy filter. And you will see that the, the results that we achieve are quite surprising. This is a movie made uh, by uh, Julia from the Baumeister lab that shows uh, what you can achieve in, uh, in other cells. So, here is the result of our cells. Uh, you can see here infected macrophages, in this particular case with uh, Mycobacterium marinum, a uh, less virulent uh, strain that, uh, can, that has also expressed the secretion system, and we can very nicely see where those bacteria are. And then we uh, get it in the FIP. We determine, based on the LM, where to make the lamellae. We make a uh, these little uh, holes in the ice so that we can better align and as was done by the Baumeister lab. And then we start making these lamellae that become thinner and thinner until we get uh, the required <coughs> thickness. And then we can even go back to the cryo LM and look whether we can find the fluorescence back. And that is uh, not so trivial. It uh, is possible, but it is not a routine yet. And also the resolution in Z is far too low to precisely determine where to make the lamellae. So these are happy, lucky, good shots. And also it's not yet precise enough to say, this is my secretion system and underneath in your tomogram you will find your complex. That is the next dream, I think. And there are many groups 
in the world working on it. And the idea is that perhaps we need a light microscope being built in, a focused ion beam, and perhaps we should not use the scanning EM for the imaging because that is destroying the GFP while doing it. And maybe a high resolution cryopolym with only a focused ion beam is sufficient to get these beautiful lamellae where you uh, get uh, the best, potentially the best results. But um, I'm happy to show you that uh, making these lamellae is now uh, quite a routine and uh, we can make them as you can see here. And we have also beautiful results in the microscope. And as Lilo said, I do already more than 25 years of EM and uh, looked for many years also to transmembrane protein complexes in mammalian cells. And I never saw them until a few months ago. So it is for me personally a breakthrough in my career that I can share with you that uh, we have now beautiful membrane complexes in mammalian cells and that we can use those in the future to do sub-volume averaging and get to a real good structure. So for this purpose, to validate this, rather than going to an unknown type 7, we decided to pick a type 3 uh, in Yersinia. And so what you see there is this very same kind of bacteria in the phagosome. And what you can see here is the bacteria interior, the inner and the outer membrane, and here is the membrane of the host cell, as you can see on top. So this is the, the inside the human uh, macrophage, the ribosomes in the macrophage, the membrane of the phagolysosome, and here the outer and the inner membrane, and here the ribosomes of the cytosol in the bacteria. And as you can see, um, we have also a quite nice uh, 3D uh, volumes. And here you can see, in fact, in this 120 nanometer uh, thick slice that was a tomogram and then 3D volumes that we can see many uh, transmembrane proteins in the host cell but also many proteins in the membrane of the bacteria. And of course you can see the type 3 secretion system and not uh, one but as you can see there two very close together and that is what we see very often that we see two or three of these uh, secretion systems very close together and they are in fact pushing the membrane of the host. They make contact and they really make some uh, very often indentations in the host membrane. So this is a result that we would like to push further and I'd like to show you an optical slice of such a chromogram to better demonstrate the quality that we are achieving with this 200 kilovolt. Here are the ribosomes, the transmembrane in the bacteria, but also many in the host cell. And I can show you here with the pointer. You can see them all here laying next to each other. And here is the interaction of the type 3 with a host membrane protein complex that we wish to look further into. And so if you want to look further into this, you need to collect many of them. And this is a very tedious task. So we have Kasper in our lab who spent a few months collecting these uh, type 3 secretion systems. And here you can see a collage of about uh, 25 of them, but in fact he got a few hundreds. And here is just an example of how we then collect them and start aligning them so that we can go to 3D reconstruction. So to repeat what I just said, you make your tomogram, you pick your protein complex, in this case a type 3, and then you start to uh, you uh, use subtomogram averaging, you align the particles and you go around this circle until you have uh, the perfect match. And from there you get uh, a 3D structure. And this is currently our latest result of last week, where we now have uh, the preliminary data of this averaging. We have not yet uh, completed uh, this work, but um, we will push it in the next uh, two, three months. There are many areas for which not much detail is yet known and we hope to find in the searing area details but also at the host cell and the host membrane protein complex. This is completely rather new territory. So I think that uh, what I like to bring as a message is that even though you have very little contrast in images of a single particle, you can get to beautiful results there. 
that is also a tool for, I believe, now the tomograms that we are generating and get to a high structure. So that is almost the end of my talk because uh, I can't share with you the type 7 secretion system in these microbacteria. We are going after it, but they are very difficult to find. It's not obvious. They, they don't lay there like the type 3. That is something that I can reveal to you. So the correlation between the GFP tagging and determining in the tomogram where is my protein complex is going to be essential. So that is for us a very high priority. And uh, so we hope to work together with you guys and others in order to achieve this uh, technic technological task. And that's not trivial. So to conclude, I think that uh, we are working on a fight against TB by exploring new territories in cryo-EM and uh, developing <coughs> new techniques that will lead to a better detail of uh, such a secretion system in order to block it uh, during the development of small compounds or by creating neutralizing antibodies against quaternary structures that are exposed on the outside of the TB bacilli. And um, that is the work that is, I think, relevant for this cryo-EM community. There is another part in my lab that in fact is also working on looking to this pathogen in something that looks like a mini lung. Uh, TB is um, a human pathogen, so mice and rat won't get sick on the street or in the wild. Um, and there is not yet a human lung system available. So since I worked already for 25 years with Hans Cleavers uh, in Utrecht on establishing <coughs> organoids from human adult tissue based on stem cell technology, where we were able to get stem cell organoids uh, from uh, intestine and from pancreatic tissue and from liver and many other epithelial tissues, we decided uh, four years ago in Maastricht to initiate a human lung organoid tissue culture system. In parallel, Hans did the same, and both labs were able to uh, get those two. And so on the right, you see the first example of um, a human lung organoid. And you can see that in this human lung organoid, there are ciliated cells. <coughs> and these ciliated cells are able to uh, circulate the mucus that is secreted by these uh, uh, cells. And we are now infecting uh, these organoids with vaccine. Uh, <coughs> and what we have done in Maastricht is, uh, under biosafety level 2, um, we have infected them with BCG and marinum. And we have discovered that in contrast to normal macrophages, where they very easily are taken up into the phagosome, in these organoids, it is almost impossible to infect the epithelial cells. I come back to you in a minute. And that, uh, so there is uh, a very strong, protective, primitive innate immune system that keeps the bug outside of the, the interior of the cell by moving the cilia around with mucus, as it is happening probably also in the lung. And so we have decided to work together with a lab that has a biosafety level 3 and good microscopy facilities. And so we reached out to Tom Ottenhoff here in Leiden, but uh, also to Olivier Renault, and Olivier has a really high quality uh, microscopy facility in the lab, and uh, so he initiated a collaboration with us to get uh, to um, proper uh, infection of the real TB, and we're using currently the RV strain, and we are about to use the Beijing strain, and those are the real pathogens that are also killing the people. And so we will update you, hopefully in one year, what the results are. There's nothing more to tell than what I just told you. And I think that this is a nice endeavor together. And what, I, what my dream is to study the type 7 secretion system and the physiology in the context of organoids in infected macrophages. So we will bring in macrophages inside there too. We have already good results that macrophages will migrate inside to the to the pathogen, create granuloma formation uh, in these lung organoids, and then high pressure freeze these samples, and then do cryo-like microscopy and electron microscopy to determine when type 7 gets expressed, whether it's continuously, con constitutively, 
on the membrane or only once it enters the phygosome, we don't know all these things and these are essential elements. So I believe that the cryo-EM part and this kind of physiology is a nice combination to study this all together. So that is the end of my talk and I'd like to advertise um, one of my last slides, my TED talk in which I showed you, which I expressed something completely different based on some stories that students in my lab told me. So they told me that they had chlamydia infection and also a human papilloma virus infection and they got the beginning of a carcinoma in situ. And I was so shocked that I decided I devote a TED talk on this. And so uh, even Joachim Frank uh, made a retreat on this uh, TED talk and I invite you to have a look at it. It is uh, hopefully interesting to see. So with that, I like to acknowledge uh, the people in my lab and I would like to acknowledge Carmen Lopez Iglesias and Ramon Ravelli as a senior scientist in the group, associate professors both, and um, Kasper, who is not on the picture, who did make the, oh here is Kasper, who made the Lamele, and Axel, who is on the picture, who uh, made together with GA the type 7 education system, and Nino, who is in charge of the organoids, and Frank and Julia, and uh, René, together with Bart, who work on the vitro chat, with a few more people now in the team. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and look forward to questions. Thank you, Peter. Um, very much looking forward to see some uh, vitro jets in the wild and uh, <laughs> see uh, how they perform. So, any people are welcome, by the way, uh, yes. to come to Maastricht and see it. Yeah. Questions? To the, to, the? to the dimerization or potential dimerization of the type uh, 3 secretion system. Yeah. You said you often saw them as pairs. I wonder yeah. if that was biologically known or had a biological relevance. Yeah, there is uh, one paper that, uh, is, that uh, is using mini cells, and mini cells is a uh, genetically modified uh, E. coli that is so small that you don't need to make lamellae. They are 200 nanometer. Much lower resolution, of course, because they're not really uh, the the ones that we have, the native, but uh, they indicated also um, a group in London, I forgot the name of the first author, but they mentioned also that there is uh, more than one together pushing uh, against the host membrane. But it's not a, a dimer as it is biochemically, eh? they are just closely together, but often also three, we see. And they often, they even make a little uh, corner and they, you can really see that they that they push like, yeah, like, like this. So they interact with the host cell membrane and you can see a response from the host cell membrane side itself as well. You mentioned that uh, you're not quite sure whether E61 complex is expressed only once it is inside the bacteria. So if it would, then it would not be a very useful target for vaccine development. That's true. But we don't have many choices. There are only five types 7 secretion systems and there's another auto-membrane protein complex that we know of that exists. We don't know of anything else yet that comes out of the, the entire bacilli exposed to the immune system. Uh, and we hope that if you study one, maybe the others will be constitutively expressed and that we can use this knowledge uh, for either one. And <coughs> I think that the different groups are also going to help each other achieving a, a goal to get a vaccine, because that is the ultimate uh, goal of one of us and all of us. Did you and, think and, that rather than using proteins to, to use the very complicated lipids that microbacteria have as yeah. for vaccine development? Yeah, I worked on that. Uh, lipids are different than peptides, eh? so peptides are presented via MHC <coughs> class 1 or 2, and when it is exogenous class 2, but lipids, especially for mycobacteria tuberculosis, are presented in the context of an MHC1-like protein, and that is called CD1. And we know that CD1B and C uh, are major protein complexes that present some components of the lipid that fit in the cleft of uh, the CD1 molecule, exposing it to uh, CD4 and CD8 uh, positive T cells. They are less restrictive 
And so there is also an immune response against those uh, lipids. An alternative approach. Yeah, the group of Michael Brenner and colleagues uh, are doing that work <coughs> at Harvard, but many other groups as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I actually have a, a couple of questions. Maybe the, maybe the first one is a bit quick. So this this uh, this image of the lung polymer that you showed. So what's the scale there? I had some difficulty. Oh yeah, it fits exactly in the vitro in, in the in the high pressure freezer, 300 micrometer. Okay. Yeah. But they can become a little bit larger if you use uh, some uh, different type of uh, organoids. Next week you will see a paper appearing in Cell in which I contributed, where we have for the first time ever human liver organoids based on biopsies from liver. Uh, and uh, intestinal colon organoids grow faster, 10 times faster than lung organoids, and they become also a bit larger. But you can easily split them by shaking them, and then they become smaller again, and they grow again in matri gel. And um, I also have a technical question. So, so you said that uh, after you made uh, the mela, you can put it back into the cryolite microscope, and then you see uh, sometimes there's a signal, sometimes not, because yeah. you miss it. So do the, are the mela damaged by the electron like, transfer uh, at all? Or? Yeah, the, the, the truth is eh, that we have a horrible situation with regard to the workflow. Eh? The, there is not a good in vacuum system from one to the other. And so it is all uh, low quality transfer. And we have argued for uh, three, four years with colleagues from FEI to implement the Leica uh, transfer system and uh, use that as a way to get in vacuum from one to the other. But that never resulted into a, something that was going to uh, happen despite all the efforts that we put in and also the negotiations that we had. So the, the, the results I think are like you probably have here too, that sometimes it works and uh, you get contamination. And so we have decided at the moment not to put too much focus on it. We have done everything to make maps working and to get the, the workflow going, but we, we saw that the core site was put out of the business, like I stopped um, selling these instruments, and so we lost motivation. We have a project together with STW to push it even further, and the, the person, Christoph, who was in charge, in fact, left because he was so demotivated that he was so disappointed that, uh, that this was not going to uh, an end. And now we see that uh, uh, FEI is, uh, in fact, working together with Leica to get uh, hopefully to a next step. But this is still a very slow process. And I think that uh, we should work with uh, our friends in Delft, Delmic, and see whether we have in a few years a uh, high quality uh, cryo light microscope inside the chamber of a focused ion beam. And, and, uh, and then maybe we have better results. And, uh, because Sometimes uh, you said that, uh, or you said that you sometimes miss the uh, your your uh, regional particle of interest because of the Z resolution. Right? Yeah. So what's the Z resolution that you need? Could you well, uh, um, well, I think we all want a 50 nanometer resolution or more, because uh, let's say a type seven screening system is 25 nanometer, and you have many protein complexes next to each other, and what you want is to collect hundreds of them. And so you need to correlate your fluorescent signal with your macromolecular complex for picking. So your picking is com it completely depends on your fluorescent signal. If you want to follow this approach, we are now completely ignoring fluorescence and have a complete new approach to go after it by having mega bodies hanging under your structure. So something that looks like a proteasome or something that you can identify that is uh, hooked up to your uh, protein complex, together with Jan Steinhardt in uh, Brussels. And so we can later uh, do template matching and look for the templates, and then we know that nearby is our protein of interest. That is a new approach. So disregarding the fluorescence, or doing it alternatively, or maybe doing both at the same time and having a tag on this mega body as well. Is that clear to everybody? What I, yeah. More questions? Yeah. One question. Hi. I wonder what kind of cell types you have in your lung organoids. 
Yeah, so uh, these are uh, patients from the Maastricht area that came for surgery because they have lung cancer. And so what you uh, have to do is to get uh, informed consent and permission, and that is a one, two year project of all paperwork. And then you finally have the possibility to get uh, uh, tissue from the tumor and also healthy tissue that is next to it because they need to remove also some healthy lung tissue. And if you have good friends with the surgeon and, and, and or the pathologist, they provide you with uh, the proper healthy lung. Yeah. And so the granulomas are made mostly upper part of the lung, and so we are very eager to get also from there. That is currently a new approach and also new ingredients because uh, actually bronchioli don't have cilia, as you know. So the bacteria reside in the bronchioli and not in the bronchioli. And the bronchioli is the very end station before you reach the very end. Uh, and so we don't have pneumocyte 1 and 2 in our organoids. But in the bronchioli, you have five different cell types that make up the bronchioli, and all those are present in the proper ratio in these lung organoids. Still very interesting, because every pathogen has to reach and go through this, and the body is trying to, to avoid getting into the, into the alveoli, of course. But making organoids of alveoli is not trivial. We have worked on it for a long time. So it, there is an unknown growth factor that we don't know of yet. That is, and we think there are no stem cells in the, the alveoli. And that we need to find another trick of getting there via the IPS system. If that is something that is clear to you. Yeah. Thanks again, uh, Peter, for a nice talk. Thank you. Only fun. Just in time for snacks and drinks, so don't worry, just uh,